thank everybody for coming and taking time off to attend this discussion. A little bit about myself, I'm uh, Dr. Nikarunakara, and for the last 18 years I've been working with a medical humanitarian organization called Medicines on Frontiers, or Doctors Without Borders. It is today the largest medical humanitarian organization in the world, providing health care uh, to people affected by conflict, natural disasters, epidemics in, in uh, around 70 countries. Today we are talking about access to medicine. We have uh, um, an excellent uh, panel here. Uh, Eldred is, uh, is from Mumbai and uh, uh, he's an activist and he will talk a little bit about the work that he does. Uh, and then we will go to Homa, who is uh, Dr. Mansoor, is uh, the HIV TB expert and uh, advises MSF programs in India. And Dylan Mohan Gray is a director of the much acclaimed um, uh, Fire in the film, Fire in the Blood. So, Eldred. I'm Eldred Tellis, director of Sankalp Rehabilitation Trust. And I started Sankalp in 1995. Um, I've been working in the field of drug abuse prevention and HIV since 1984. Working with this very marginalized community of injecting drug users really began in 95 for me. The injectors are like marginalized even among the drug users. Many of them had so many associated problems due to uh, total neglect and that there was much more work to be done. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Huma and I've been working with MSF since uh, uh, a long time, like five years down the line. We have been providing treatment uh, to seropositive or HIV positive patients. It has been seen in various studies that uh, the prevalence of hepatitis C in drug user is almost 50 to 55 percent. There are about 20 million people in our country with hep C. I mean 20 million is not the number of injecting drug users for sure. So it has gone into other parts of the general population and a lot of it through blood transfusion. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, HIV, we know a lot about it, we talk about it, taking two uh, multidrug resistant TB and hepatitis C in India, we have large numbers of patients uh, with these diseases in this country. What kind of changes need to happen so that patients are able to get treatment, uh, affordable treatment uh, in this country? The screening is not in place. First, the diagnosis, treatment is another part. First, you proceed from the diagnosis. Multi-drug resistant TB, it's, it's a big, big problem over here. It's like, to start with, everybody is prescribing everything which is under the sky for drug-sensitive TB. There should be some treatment guideline which need to be followed throughout. It's not being done. Private practitioner will have their own schemes, some own regimen. So this need to change. We're talking about the problem. Let's talk about the solution to it. But the solution itself is a problem. Why? Because the drugs are very costly. And how do we bring down this price? So there should be competition between the generic uh, producers, which is very much instrumental in bringing down the price. And what we see, the pharmaceutical company, they have this excuse of uh, uh, having the patent law. Uh, the excuse being that that amount of, uh, this is required for proper R&D. But I don't think so the R&D is being done in the developing countries. It's more for the developed country the R&Ds are being done. I remember one of my friends in Manipur, he sold his land wife's jewelry just to get treated for hep C. And the treatment was not even like 100%, you know, that you're going to be cured. Here's a guy giving up everything just to be able to live. Are there other countries out there that have the capacity to produce generic drugs and are able to deal with the problem? Uh, if, for, for example, in, uh, at some point, if India is not able to produce generic drugs? The ones that we know best are uh, Brazil, Thailand, um, South Africa. Uh, something that's quite unique in India, however, two, two aspects are very unique in India. First of all, because of the, uh, you know, later in the film we deal with the patent law that came in in 1970, and this created a boom in generic uh, pharmaceutical 
production here in this country, and um, there are estimated 25,000 pharmaceutical companies in India, probably 100 quite big ones. Uh, that export to every single corner of the world. Also because of the price controls in this country, you know, the, co the companies have had to become very, very efficient. You know, the, the patent holding, uh, monopoly holding companies have no incentive to be efficient because their production costs are such a tiny sliver of the, of the cost that they're charging people for the end products. The second aspect, which is very, very important, is that uh, here in India you have the uh, um, <coughs> pharmacy is uh, something that you can study at a the undergraduate level. There's a huge amount of graduates in pharmacy that come out of the education system in this country, and that's quite unique. I uh, heard somewhere that it's something like two lakh per year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's not just a question of being able to put up factories and uh, to have the, the sort of uh, legal framework to produce drugs. You also need the people. Today we have uh, drug companies giving donations to treat all of the patients around the world. Can you put donations in perspective to, let's say, generic production, competition, etc. What is the important takeaway message here? They always talked about the donations that they're doing and how cheap they're giving it to people. And the figures they put out is that, okay, we are giving access to 95% of your people, which is not true, actually. So they, they give donations so that they can, it becomes a talking point for them to show that they're making their drugs accessible but that's just a cover-up to be able to sell it at exorbitant rates. And that's when the first chance I got to take up Roche because I realized that Roche was the only one who was giving now Peg interferon and uh, it was costing something like 8,72,000. And that's when I took up this cause of challenging the patent for that Roche was granted. There are so many other generics that they are strategically getting out of the way, either by buying them out for much, much more than they're worth, or by getting them into some litigation, which is stretched and stretched and stretched, where you know you have to pay out so much money for litigation that in the end they will you know, just uh, let go. So these are strategies, I think, that uh, the big pharma are using. And that is why civil society awareness is very important. We have to spread this knowledge because if our generics sell out, uh, we are going to suffer a lot. We have to put things in perspective a, a little bit. If you th can imagine that in the year 2000, there, was hardly, there were hardly any patients being provided ARVs by their healthcare system in the continent of Africa and then if you can imagine that 10 years later that 8 million patients are on treatment, then you say, okay, change is possible. Things have changed. But at the same time, I also have the feeling that we are putting out small fires, but we have not really addressed the big problem. Uh, a system that is broken, that needs to be overhauled. We have to completely rethink the way uh, innovation is rewarded. Uh, that uh, that uh, we also have to recognize that we cannot, as citizens, give away all of the responsibility for addressing medical problems and doing the research and development to drug companies. The government also has a role to play. The public has to take its responsibility. I think it's very important that people take ownership of this and say, you know, the system is us. You know, we have created this... No. I maybe didn't do anything actively to create it, but I am a citizen, and these things are being done in my name. And uh, you know, we have to understand that we do have power, and we have, and, and this system that exists is us. I want to ask each of the panelists to perhaps talk about two two essential things that need to change uh, in order to uh, f stop medicines uh, from being a luxury. The government has to get its act together in terms of price control. Tamil Nadu is a good example of uh, keeping price control of essential drugs. And I think the government has to get its act together, get compulsory licensing in place so that at least for this, for Hep C for example we're talking about, there should be, you know, compulsory licensing. For me the most important thing is uh, monopoly for 20 years is too big a time. So we, we it should be at least, of course, like three years down the line and it should be open for all kind. That is important. And secondly, there should be some contribution, like their excuses, they find it right because they say they invest so much on it. So I think so the government should also contribute to this investment in order to lower down the price. What, what is missing here, uh, 
more than anything else is transparency. Um, so, you know, we've got these a lot of fake figures out there about the amount of money that's invested in pharmaceuticals. Uh, it started with the $800 million pill. Uh, that was about 12 years ago or 15 years ago. Now that figure has risen to $1.4 billion. That's the number uh, which the pharmaceutical lobby in the U.S. says it costs per per drug that gets to market. So, you know, if you're saying we, the drug company, are innovating, we are spending all this money on research and development, open your books. If we have a patent law, if we have intellectual property, what is the point of it, you know? Because these things were developed for a reason, and the reason was to serve the public interest. And I think what's missing in a lot of these discussions is, what is the public interest? You know, I think that you'd get a very different answer to that question if you ask the public. And, you know, I think that uh, we have to keep advancing the cause of the public interest. And here, I think much more work uh, needs to be done. And it can only be done by um, the patients, the medical community, the activists. Activists are very often patients and doctors and uh, other interested parties coming together. You cannot exclude pharmaceutical companies from this discussion. They have to be part of it as well. You cannot ex exclude the government, whether they are controlled by religious factions, whether they are controlled by other groups. Government, the elected body that is supposed to look after the interests of patients, they all have to come together to find uh, a solution to address this problem. So I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you.